Today we're kicking off a brand new series that we're calling Christmas Playlist. Perhaps no other season is defined by music uh, more than Christmas. So how many of you, you're like, you are Christmas music fanatics. Like you love you, some Christmas music. Anybody willing to raise their hand? Okay, a few. And a few of you like Grinches in the room. Okay, come on, get it together. Uh, it's December the 5th. But a lot of you love Christmas music. How many of you, you're going to be real enough in church today to say that like even since like the day after Thanksgiving, like the turkeys not even in the refrigerator yet left for the leftovers. How many of you are already jamming some Christmas music? Okay, awesome. A lot of you. Okay, so that's good because we sang some of that today. A lot of people love Christmas music and I um, mean, it's everywhere. Like literally this season, maybe more than any other season or time of the year is kind of marked by songs and by music, uh, whether that's like a Christmas program that you go to that like your kid or grandkids in, you take like a million pictures or maybe it's a musical that you watch on TV or it's the radio stations that just take everything and throw it out the window except for Christmas music, right? All the way up until December 25th. But it's a season marked by music. And uh, if you've been around long enough, you know that how we consume music as a people, it has changed a little bit throughout the generations. Has it not? Okay, I'm gonna take some of you back for a moment. Uh, How many of you are old enough to admit that like you listen to Christmas music at some point in your life on one of these bad boys? You show them that picture. How many of y'all listen to some Christmas music? Uh Uh-huh, some of y'all, y'all fessing up right now. You telling how old you are. Somebody told me I'm not taking it back far enough because they didn't show the record player, okay? Um, but like, that's a, for all my young folks in the room, okay, that's an eight track player. Some of them were like, is that a radar space machine? Like, will that take you back to the future? Yeah, it'll take you back. All right, it just took some people back right there, okay? And they listened to that. It's called an eight track player. And then like, we got crazy technological after that. We advanced up and we started listening to music on one of those bad boys. Anybody remember that? Okay, yeah, cassette player. How good were those? All right, anybody lo- loving some cassette player? It was great, okay? It was really, really good um, until like the little strip got off, okay, inside the thing. And then you had to figure out how to wind that bad boy back in. All right, if you, you had a fat finger, you couldn't get your fat finger in the hole. So you had to get like, like a pencil or something. Some of my fat finger people, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, you don't, don't raise your hand on that. But like, you had to wind that thing back in. And some of you boys, some of y'all made some love mixtape for some girl like on a cassette player. You, you had to scrub that thing back and then get it again. Okay, some of my younger generation, y'all got no idea. You, you have no idea. There was no picking the point in the song. It was like, press rewind, let go, and just guess where you gonna land up. Okay, that's what it was. And then on my 1990s uh, kids, here we go. This is our next one. All right, yeah, the CD player. Let's give it up for the CD player. Everything changed at that point. It was no more like rewind, guess where you are in the song, because now you could go straight to the song that you wanted, okay? Just hit that skip button, and you could go through the first four songs on the track that you didn't like, and you could arrive on number five. Those are great, okay? Uh, As long as you were sitting still, they were great, right? (laughs) Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Okay, like if you're sitting still, it's great. Gen Z, just listen. You're learning, all right? We're taking you to school right here, all right? But if you hit the bumpy road, okay, and you were going on vacation on the bumpy road, or you try to take that bad boy walking around the block, don't even jog, don't even, okay? Because it would start skipping, all right? When you, when you bounced a little bit, that thing would skip and then your CD would get all scratched and then you couldn't listen to your man anymore or your girl, whoever you listen to. And, and now, man, it's changed a lot. Okay, we've advanced all the way. So some people listen to music now on one of those. How many of you got an iPod? How many of you like, yep, not many, okay? But some of us have an iPod. Most of us are like, well, I need an iPod. I got a phone in my pocket, okay? And so that's where we are today. Like we've come... That far, that's, that's a long way from the eight track player and the record player, is it not, all right? And now you can man, pull that phone out of your pocket and if I named any song, you could get that thing streaming within a matter of seconds, just like that. And then you could scrub to any point you wanted in the song if you wanted to, okay? Uh, a little easier to make a mixtape today and just stream it for your girlfriend, all right? But we've advanced so far and now we stream things through apps like Spotify and Apple Music and Pandora and all that good stuff. Uh, and now we, we put our music on a playlist, okay? And now some of my uh, more experienced generation, let me say this to you, okay, you're going like, what's a playlist, okay? A playlist is um, where you get all your favorite songs and you put them together in one spot. Like you make your own CD. It's this generation's version of a mixtape is what that is. And so now you can make your own playlist, whether that's Christmas or your favorites. How many of you, you got a favorites playlist on your streaming app? Awesome, yeah, a lot of you, okay? And, and so like, that's where we're living nowadays is we just play it off of the playlist, Over the next few weeks, we're going to look at Scripture to actually realize that, did you know Scripture has a playlist? Like that there's a song playlist. It's actually a Christmas playlist that we're going to kind of dive into three different songs that probably you haven't spent a lot of time in that I think are going to speak into our lives as we step into the Christmas season together. So if you have a copy of Scripture, open up to Luke chapter 1. 
Luke chapter 1 in the New Testament is where we're going to be. If you don't have a harder digital copy of Scripture, as always, we'll put some verses on the screen from wherever you're joining today here in the room or online. Uh, Luke chapter 1 and 2 is where all of our songs over the next three weeks, they're going to be in these uh, two chapters. And as you turn there today, uh, I just want to kind of give you some context that leads up to our first track, if you will, on the song. Um, It starts with an angel who visits a guy by the name of Zachariah. If you don't know a whole lot about Zachariah, we'll talk about him uh, next week. But an angel appears to Zachariah. The reason Zachariah matters is because Zachariah was the husband of Elizabeth, who is the cousin of Mary, who is the mother of Jesus. All right, so he's kinfolk of Mary now because he done married into the family. And the angel comes to Zechariah and he says, hey, you and Elizabeth are going to have a child and you're going to be a dad. And Zechariah is like blown away. Like he's speechless. Literally, literally, he's speechless. Okay, like four of you got the joke. It'll make more sense next week. Read your Bible. Okay, but like Zechariah, he's speechless. He doesn't know what to do. Um, But this baby that Elizabeth's going to have, his wife is going to be called John the Baptist and he would play a really pivotal role in scripture. But about the same time that the angel shows up, To Zechariah, the angel also shows up to a young teenage girl named Mary. And she says, hey, and you're pregnant too. And see, the thing about Mary was that she wasn't married. And so the angel says, no, you're pregnant by the Holy Spirit with the Son of God. I don't know if you've ever gotten like life-altering news before. I'm talking about like life-altering, not like your Tuesday's bad. Like life-altering news. But that's what happened to this teenage girl named Mary. And she gets this news that she is great with child and it is the son of the living God. And so, of course, Mary's fired up because she's pregnant and Elizabeth's excited because she's pregnant. So Mary goes to see Elizabeth to show her the sonogram and she shows up at Elizabeth's house. And here's how amazing this moment was. There weren't sonograms? Okay, maybe not. She shows up to Elizabeth's house and here's how amazing this moment was. The, The baby inside of Elizabeth's womb leaps for joy because Mary walks in and this baby in here knows who this baby in here is. That he was in the presence of who would be the Messiah, the Son of God. And in that moment, man, they rejoice, Mary and Elizabeth, and they hug and they cry and they pick out their colors for the nursery and all the things that the ladies do. And in this moment, man, you just have to like put yourself in those shoes. Like Mary is overwhelmed. You see, when a teenage girl or a young girl became pregnant in this day, they would often just stay in hiding. And for Mary to make things even crazier, she's pregnant by God. Tell that to your parents or friends and sell it, okay? And that's where Mary is. She's pregnant with the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the coming Redeemer. And so most girls in Mary's place would have been overwhelmed. They would have been ashamed, but that's not Mary's response, And in this moment, Mary responds with a song. She writes and declares a song. And in the middle of the unknown in front of her, can you imagine the unknown? In the middle of the unknown in front of her, Mary sings a song. She doesn't just sing any song, but today we'll realize that song is called the Magnificat. It's a song of praise of all things in the middle of the unknown. And here's what I know today as we men step into the Christmas season and all that that means for so many of us. And some of you today, you're living in the season of the unknown. You are. And maybe for you, there's an important relationship in your life and it's at the lowest place that it's ever been. And you don't know if it's going to recover and you're living in the unknown right now of God, I don't know what to do. And maybe over the last week or month or so, you got laid off. And you're in the unknown of like, which opportunity, where do I look next? And then even how do we cover the bill that's coming in the mail this month or next month? And you're living in that space of the unknown. Or maybe for somebody, you and your spouse are longing for a child. Speaking of pregnancy, you're longing for that. But you're in the unknown of, I I don't know if that's going to happen like we want it to happen. And you're in the unknown. Or maybe it's for you or somebody you love. Man, the health news has not been the health news that you wanted to get. And here we are at holidays, and you're thinking about that, and you're in the unknown of, I don't even know how this is going to play out next. Or or maybe today you're single, and you're going, the greatest desire of my heart is just companionship, that I would, and that I could have someone, that God would give someone to me. And you're, you're in that unknown of if that desire will ever be met. You see, 
there's a good chance that there are a lot of us today, as we enter Christmas, the most hopeful and joyful time of the year, I mean, you're sitting in the unknown. And what I want you to know today is that Mary was living in the moment of the unknown, and her life began to declare a song. And so here's just the question I just want you to ponder for a moment. In your place of unknown, in that season or moment of unknown that maybe you're living in today, if you had to declare and name the song that your life is singing, what song is your life declaring? Mary penned a song. And I want us to read it today. And my hope is that Mary's song in her unknown would speak and encourage you in your unknown today because God's word is living and it's active and it speaks into our lives. And so let's look at what Mary began to say. Luke chapter one, verse 46. <clears throat> and Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior. Now notice it says, look at it. Mary's soul glorified the Lord, and her spirit rejoiced in God. It doesn't say anything about her words. It doesn't say anything about her singing voice. In other words, her song didn't start with an outward expression, but it started with an inward response. And here's what I would say to you today is that a song in the face of the unknown places of life often starts on the inside. Sometimes you have to believe the song inside of you before you can declare it out of you. Amen. But the question is, well, how, how do I believe? If I'm sitting in the unknown, how do I believe it in here before I can say it and live it out here? And I believe Mary begins to reflect that to us. You see, you can only find the strength to believe it in here inwardly if you are resetting yourself internally, consistently in truth. All right, don't miss that. You can only believe if you're resetting yourself internally, consistently in truth. If you're not resetting yourself internally, consistently, you will never move to external praise. It'll never really be true. And Mary demonstrates that. Mary made it a practice to reset, to recenter herself consistently in who God was, in his truth. In fact, in the 10 verses of Mary's song that we're going to read today, there are 12 references to the Old Testament. In other words, Mary was in the word. Mary was in the truth of who God was, of what had been recorded about him. And God's word was in her heart and on her mind, and therefore it came out in her song. And Mary was centering herself in who God was. So let me ask this question to make sense for us today. How are you as a husband, as a college student, as a young adult, how are you resetting yourself consistently in Christ? Like, what does that look like for you? Honestly, let's put some flesh on it. Like, is, is scripture reading and meditating and thinking about the word, is that a consistent rhythm of your life beyond like this moment? Is it? Only you can answer that. Is, is communicating with God through prayer and talking to him throughout, is that a consistent rhythm and practice of your life? Or what about is gathering with other believers in spiritual community, okay, beyond this moment where you can learn together, you can grow together, you can care for one another, like is that a consistent rhythm of your life? What are you internally setting and resetting yourself in because we have to believe inwardly before we can truly praise outwardly. And Mary demonstrates that. And I love it in verse 47, Mary says this. She says, I rejoice, here's the phrase I want us to see, in God my Savior. I rejoice in God my Savior. In other words, Mary didn't reset herself in her circumstances. She didn't center herself in her surroundings, but she rejoiced in, she reset herself in her Savior. In God, my Savior. Mary reset herself, we could say it this way, in what mattered most. And what I say to us today is that in the middle of the unknown where some of you are, listen to me, you don't find lasting peace resetting yourself in the temporary things of the world. Let me make it real, all right? Scrolling TikTok videos and Instagram reels may make you smile as you put your head on pillow at night but it will not show up when the storms of life hit. Amen. That new boo or that new relationship that you think you have to have, it may make you feel valued for a season or on Friday night, 
But listen, they're just as broken as you are, and they will let you down somehow, some way, sometime. It will happen. Chasing that, that new job because it has an extra zero on the check, it may bring some stability and security for a season, but if you sacrifice your marriage and your family to chase the promotion, then how good is that extra zero doing? And so what I'm saying to us, church, is man, may we be aware of what we are internally, consistently resetting and recentering ourselves with. Mary reset herself in Christ. She declared, I rejoice in God my Savior. Why? Because he's the only one who satisfies my soul. He's the only one who fills me up and recenters me. In the Old Testament, the prophet Habakkuk faced a moment of great unknown, kind of like maybe some of you. And man, there's so much that was unknown. And like Mary, guess what he does? He ends his book with a hymn. He's a songwriter. And watch it. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17. Look at it on the screen. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vine. Here's what he's saying. It ain't good. Whatever's going on, it's not good at that moment. Though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, no fruit or no food, he's struggling. Like this bro is in need. It ain't good. Though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls. Like he's, he's in the unknown. He don't even know how they're going to provide for next month. I got kids, God. Do you see that? He's in an unknown. But here's his response. Verse 18. Watch it. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Come on, Habakkuk. And then what does he say? Just like Mary, I will be joyful in what? In my circumstances? No, I will be joyful in God, my Savior, the sovereign Lord. He is my strength and he makes my feet like the feet of a deer and he enables me to tread on the heights. And maybe your translation doesn't have it, but like there's this little print at the very end of Habakkuk chapter three where he wrote this and it says, for the director of music on my stringed instruments. I love that. I caught that this week. I love that there, there was a little guitar playing in the background. Somewhere Josh Jordan was just sitting and smiling, man, and he was just strumming. And I love that Habakkuk put the truth that he was declaring to song because he was believing internally that God was his savior, that he was worth rejoicing in. And he said, I will choose to rejoice in the Lord and be joyful in God, my savior. Church, here's what I'm saying to us today. No matter how scary, no matter how hopeless, no matter how dark your unknown may seem, take it from Habakkuk, you can declare a song of praise because you have a savior. Not your circumstances, but your savior. And we can center ourselves in him. Mary continues, look back at Luke 1, verse 48. Mary says, for God has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed for the mighty one has done great things for me and holy is his name. Here's the phrase I want us to see first as you look at it. Mary declares that God was mindful of her humble state. Now, remember when Mary got the, remember the life-altering, world-shaking news, who was she? She was an average, normal teenage girl, okay? She was like probably a little boy crazy. She liked taking selfies. She scrolled YouTube, trying to figure out how to make good grades in algebra class, okay? That's who Mary was. And then the Lord drops this news on her. Oh yeah, you are great with child. Uh, it's the Holy Spirit who did it. It's my son, and he's going to be the savior of the world. Good luck, Mary. <laughs> but do you remember... Mary's response. Remember what she said? Let me show you. Ten, ten verses before this, here's Mary's response. Look at it. Luke 1, 38. Mary answered, I am the Lord's servant. And may your word to me be fulfilled. Are you kidding me? Mary says, God, if you call me to it, then I'm going to trust you through it. What an incredible response of humility. But, you know, I believe Mary's humility probably started way before that moment. Like as she was loving God, following God as a young woman in that society, I mean, she was daily making choices of humility that then allowed her to respond with this amazing humility in the greatest unknown moment of her life. And she responds with humility. And I want to pull some truths out today to give us something to grab onto. And here's the first one. Catch this today. In the face of the unknown, 
God honors a response of humility. God will honor a response of humility. You can write that down. Mary sang and she obeyed in the face of the unknown. But where did it start? It started with her humility. Why? Because worship and obedience, they always begin with humility. They always start with a humble spirit. So let me kind of ask you some questions today. Get up in your business for a second. Let me ask you, how are you doing at living with humility? Don't answer out loud. How are you doing at living with humility? Like, like when you walk into a room or a conversation, do you need everybody in that room or that conversation to know who you are and what you've done and what you bring to the table? In your marriage, in your family, at your workplace, your circles, is your way always what's right? Do, do, do you have trouble serving in ways or areas or opportunities that are maybe not as glamorous or noticed as others? Holy Spirit speaks. How are you doing or what's keeping you? Let's say that. What's keeping you from living and walking with humility? See, Mary's response was humility. Here's what God's word says. Watch this one verse, Psalm 138, verse 6. It says, though the Lord is great, here it is, don't miss it, he cares for the humble, but he keeps his distance from the proud. God's word, not mine. Scripture says God's heart, his face, turns towards those who walk in humility, but it turns away from those who walk and live in pride. So let me ask you, which way do you respond more? Where are you most? Mary's response, it began with humility. God, you call me to be your servant. Here I am. And worship and obedience began with humility. Pick up her song in verse 50, Luke chapter 1, verse 50. It says, his mercy, God's mercy, extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. Over the next few verses, Mary's song, it's not about her anymore, but it changes. It kind of changes the pattern and the, and the delivery to describe the greatness and the character of of God. And, and watch this. Maybe you don't pick this up, but sometimes um, what happens in our worship as we gather and we sing songs together, just like we did a while ago, sometimes we sing songs um, about God. Like, God, great are you. You are holy. You are good. You are we sing songs about God. Sometimes we sing songs about God. Sometimes we sing songs to God about us. God, you can have my heart. Lord, I need you. God, I'm desperate for you. All right? Both of those kind of songs are important. In this moment, Mary begins to sing a song and declare a song about God. God, this is who you are. He knew who he was, but she was declaring it because she was resetting. She was centering herself in what was mattered most and who was true. And so she begins to lay this out, all right? And she says, God's mercy extends to those who what? Who fear him. Let's talk about that for a second. God is full of mercy towards those who fear him. Well, we know what it means to fear or be scared of something in the world. Like we got that, okay? Scary movie, the dark, whatever it is, okay? But sometimes we can get a little confused on what does it mean to fear God as scripture talks about, okay? Fearing God is the beginning of wisdom. It's following Jesus. So I'm going to give you kind of a working definition. We'll break it down for just a second. Fearing God means to have a loving reverence for God that then does this, that results in submission to his lordship, his leadership, and to the commands of his word. All right, a lot of words in that. I'll say it one more time. It means to have a loving reverence for God that results in submission to his lordship and to the commands of his word. In short, to fear God means to submit to him and to follow the commands of his word, okay? I state that to ask this question for us to evaluate for a second, which means when we hear that, God looks for those who fear him. Then we have to ask ourselves the question, all right, am I submitting and following the commands of God's word in the areas of my life where he calls me to walk in righteousness, okay? Like with my money or whoop, his money, all right? With my purity, in my forgiveness, in my servant spirit, in my love, in my gentleness, in my compassion, am I submitting to him, his lordship, and am I following the commands of his word as he teaches it? Am I walking in that? Now, as you think that, okay, here's the question that we have to follow that with. If I'm not fully following and submitting, then am I truly fearing? 
am I truly fearing? And, and God's word says here, submitting and following is fearing. And scripture says, that's who God's mercy extends to. Those who fear and follow him. Now Mary ends verse 50, and I love this. Don't miss this. Mary's song says, God's mercy extends from generation to generation. I love those three words. In other words, don't ever think that the faith of a grandparent won't impact the faith of a grandchild. As I, as I read those words this week, man, I, I was reflected on my grandparents. Of Now I have no physically remaining on this earth grandparents. And I specifically thought about the faith of my grandmother, my mom's mom, who we lost last year. You see, when I was young, man, five years older, so she went through a divorce. And as I thought about her this week, I thought, man, she had to be in some ways a lot like Mary. She was left in the unknown. God, where are we going next? What's happening? Where's this going to be? How am you going to provide? All of that. And what I'm saying to you as a generation from her is that in the midst of the unknown, I'm so grateful that her faith did not waver. The declaration of her song of praise to God was steady. It was true to the point that both of her son-in-laws made a choice to surrender and follow God in full-time ministry and have for decades. Three of her five grandchildren also followed to surrender and serve God in full-time ministry. Both of her children, both of her son-in-laws, all five of her grandchildren, all five of their spouses are faithfully following Jesus. And what I'm saying today is I think there's a grandparent somewhere, all right, that needs to hear today that your consistency in truth and righteousness and forgiveness and compassion and love, it matters. It may not seem like it does, but it matters. And Scripture says from generation to generation. Mary keeps going, verse 51, pick up with me, this is good, Luke 51, or 151, he has performed mighty deeds, the Lord has, with his arm, he scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts, he's brought down rulers from their thrones, but he's lifted up the humble, he's filled the hungry with good things, but he sent the rich away empty. Don't miss this. Here's what Mary's doing. In these three verses, she gives three statements, and they're contrasting God's response to the humble versus God's response to the proud. We're gonna break each one of them down. There's good stuff in all of them for us, okay? First, Mary declares, God performs mighty deeds for his humble followers, verse 51, but he scatters those who are proud, okay? Let me put some flesh on it for us. Church, God has done mighty deeds, all right, for us and through us and in us. I'm, I'm speaking of our spiritual community, okay? Some of you kind of brand new to this house. Some of you have been walking along with us for a long time, okay? Th there is no question. God has done mighty deeds in us and through us and for us, okay? Over the last nine years, this little community that began with seven people in a living room, all right? Like God's done amazing and mighty deeds. He's brought hundreds of people to, to faith and relationship with Christ, Okay, he's impacted and blessed a city, a community, and it's trickling beyond that. All right, we've seen marriages be restored, we've seen families be healed, kids find hope, physical needs be met. Be met. Good gracious, we, we bought a thirty-three thousand square foot building that he provided for us completely debt free. All right, I'm saying, yeah, we can celebrate that, we can clap for that. What I want us to arrive is that God has been mighty indeed to us. That's not, that's not a question. He's been mighty indeed to us. But at the same time that we celebrate that, that we're in awe of that, and we should be, may we never allow it to move us to a place of pride Amen. in ourselves. Why? Well, the word says God scatters the proud. God scatters the proud. May we always be quick in any victory and any level of success that we may experience to quickly acknowledge it as the hand and the faithfulness of God in our lives and not ourselves. Why? Because the proud, hear me, the proud will be exposed. Mark it down. <laughs> but God performs mighty deeds through the humble, but he scatters the proud. And that matters for our, our, ourselves as, as a spiritual community, and it matters for you individually and your family. Okay? That was 51. She makes another statement, 52. Mary says, God has brought down prideful rulers, but he has lifted up the humble. Watch this. This is for somebody today. Church, God sits sovereignly over all rulers, authorities, powers, and governments of this world. 
God is powerful and he is sovereign enough to bring down rulers if and when he wants. He holds ultimate power over all government and all rulers. Why? Because he is the sovereign king. And we can trust him even in what you may declare as unknown. He's sovereign. Take it to the bank. Trust his character. God brings down the prideful is what it says. But, this matters, he lifts up the humble. Watch this. The truth is we must be bowed down before God can lift us up. Okay? And some of us live so standing up in our pride or maybe even self-righteousness sometimes, it's really hard for God to lift you up when you're already trying to lift you up. But when we are bowed down in humility, there's room for God to honor and lift up his children who live in humility. Jesus would say it this way, Matthew 23, verse 12. Look at it on the screen. For those who exalt themselves, well, they will be humbled in one way or another. And those who humble themselves, they will be exalted. Verse 53 the third truth that Mary declares about the character of God. Mary declares God fills the hungry with good things, but he sends the rich away empty. Now, this word hungry means both spiritually and physically. Spiritually and physically, which means God supplies for the needs of his faithful followers physically and spiritually. We all have needs physically and spiritually, and Mary's saying today, God's good in all of that. Even in the middle of the unknown, God is fully capable to meet your needs physically and spiritually. But I believe he's tagging this on today, okay? Hear this from the Holy Spirit. He wants to know if we're hungry. And I don't mean do we want a sandwich. But he wants to know do we hunger and thirst for him most. Because hear me, no matter what your need may be, our greatest need is always a spiritual need. I don't care what your bank account says. Our greatest need is a spiritual need. And Scripture says, though, that God is able to meet all needs. Want some proof? Don't listen to me. Philippians 4.19. Here's what Scripture says. And my God, Paul says, my God will meet all of your needs, all of your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Mary declared God fills the hungry with good things, but here's the second half, but he sends the rich away empty. Let me ask you for you to consider. Would you rather be a rich man by the world's temporary standards or a rich man by God's eternal standards? You see, perhaps, and let's be honest, perhaps no other season of the year creates in us that longing for more in comparison than the one that we're stepping into, right? We begin to compare what we have with what everybody else has. And man, can what I get from my kids and my grandkids is it, it's not as good as what they can get for their kids and grandkids. And there's this level of inferiority and shame and regret and comparison that sets in. And man, we can just, you can just immerse yourself in social and they'll take care of it for you if you want them to. And just, man, just immerse you in this desire for, for more. But what I'm, I'm saying to us is, listen, what Scripture says is that those who hunger for what matters most are those who are filled with good things. And so maybe, man, maybe the prayer for you today as a parent, single parent, for your kids, your teenagers, God, would you help us in these days? Would you help us to hunger for what matters most? That's it, man. It's a simple prayer, but yet an extravagant prayer. Help us to hunger for what matters most. Now, we just read verses 51 through 53. In those three verses, Mary did what? She laid out three declarations about God's character. She praised his faithfulness, his goodness, his power. And, and, and in her song, here's what she's saying to us. She's showing us how foolish it is to trust in self, to trust in government or political powers, or to trust in riches. That even in the unknown, Mary was undoubtedly putting her faith and trust in God. So let me ask you, is that true of you too? In the face of your unknown, if the song's being written about you, is that true about you too? So here's, here's, the, here's the truth, that the second one I want to grab onto for just a moment. God's character can be trusted. In the face of the unknown, 
You fill in the blank with what that looks like for you. in the face of the own. God's character can be trusted. Mary, Mary showed us that unwaveringly. In your waiting, in your hurting, in your wondering, in your hoping, in your pain, God's character can be trusted. Mary said, book it. He is who he says he is, and he is faithful, and he's true. And then Mary closes her song. Right? Her track comes to an end. There's two final verses, man, so much in these. Don't miss it. Verse 54, Luke chapter 1. God has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful, verse 55, to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Now, listen, buckle up for this. In, his, in her final two verses of her song, Mary starts looking back. Remember, she was looking vertically. God, this is who you are. She starts looking back at God's faithfulness to, to who he has been. Okay, and hear this. Maybe for some of you today, in the middle of your unknown, one of the most obedient responses is to look back at how good and mighty and faithful God has been in your life. Mary looks back, and here's what she's looking back to. She reflects on the hundreds, not weeks or decades, the hundreds of years leading up to this moment in history where the angel says, you're great with child. And as Mary looks back over hundreds of years, she goes, God, you're good. And you're merciful and you're faithful and you've always been sovereign because you see hundreds of years, don't miss this, hundreds of years before this moment, God came to another humble servant by the name of Abraham. Some of you may remember him. Abraham did this pretty mighty, obedient thing with his child where he surrendered his child to God. And watch this, in this moment in Genesis, God comes to Abraham and here's what God says in response to Abraham's obedience. Watch this, Genesis 22, verse 15. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and God said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this, because you've trusted my character and you've not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. Verse 18, he finishes the promise, and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. What a promise that God looks at Abraham and he says, hey, Abraham, I'm going to use you one man, normal guy who is obedient to me, and I'm going to use your family and all these descendants that you don't even know about. They're going to be as numerous as the stars in the sky. You can't count them. And through you, I'm going to bless all nations from generation generation to generation, then for the next 39 books of the Bible, of the Old Testament, God's people are left waiting. Not weeks, not months, not even decades, but hundreds of years, God's people are walking around going, did he really mean it? It's been 200 years. He forgot. He's, he's late. I know we've said the God of Abraham, but what he told to Abraham, he clearly forgot. Because we're in the unknown. We thought that there was coming a savior, a redeemer, a rescuer. Can you put yourself there? Hundreds of years later, God, where are you? Because it don't make sense and we don't see what's happening. Then after hundreds of years of waiting, the page turns to the New Testament. And in the very first two verses, this is what God says through his word. Matthew 1 verse 1. This is the genealogy or the family tree of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. And watch this, let me fast forward. For the next 13 verses, 
generation after generation after generation of people that you can't even, mis- you'll mispronounce their name, is laying out. These are all the people that came from Abraham after the promise. The promise, another generation, another generation, another generation. And then 13 verses later, we arrive at verse 16, and here's what it says, Matthew 1, 16. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Don't, don't miss it, church. After hundreds of years, hundreds of years of unknown, hundreds of years of God's people wondering, did God forget Did he really mean what he said? Maybe we heard it wrong. Maybe Abraham interpreted it wrong because God clearly isn't coming through. God responds as the page is turned and he says, I'm here and I'm true to my promises. I meant every word. I wasn't a second early or a second late. I never forgot. I never wavered. I was into it the whole time. In the waiting, I was present. In the unknown, I was present. And here is your Savior. Here is your Redeemer. And He is my Son. And the final truth that I want us to latch on to today is that that in the face of the unknown, God is true to his promises. Every one of them. Every one of them. God has never given a promise that he hasn't kept. And don't miss the timeline, the promise that God made to Abraham in Genesis 22, way back there. He was now bringing to fulfillment through a humble teenage girl named Mary. And God was true to his promise to Abraham. And he was true to his promise to Mary. And he has been and will be true to his promise to you. You see, the song of Christmas is the declaration that God is true to his promises. Every word, every time. And for you today, in the middle of whatever the unknown is that you stare at or walk through or live in, God's word declares to you today, take heed from Mary's song. Hear the declaration of her life in the face of the unknown that God cares for, he provides for, and he protects those who respond in humility. That his character can be trusted. No matter what the unknown looks like, bank it, his character is the same. And he is true to his promises every time. The Christmas season is filled with music, but what song is your life declaring? Perhaps today your life is echoing a song of loneliness or pain or being overwhelmed, or maybe today your life is declaring a song of hope and joy. Either way, God's word gives us truth and hope in the middle of this season. If God spoke to you through today's message and you would like to talk with someone or would just love for someone to pray with you, we would love to serve you in that way. No matter where or when you're joining the gathering, you can reach out to a member of our ministry team by simply texting your name to 601-397-6111. Our team would love to help you and encourage you as you seek to know and follow God in this season. From the exchange family to you and your family, we wish you a very Merry Christmas. And until we gather again, let's go be the church.